Harmeet. Well, thank you, Professor. Um, I'm Harmeet Dillon, and I'm going to be the moderator of the first panel, which is on gerrymandering past and present. And we decided amongst ourselves here on this panel that we were going to do more of a conversational style of a panel uh, where we'll pose some questions and then each of the panelists will have an opportunity to comment on them and hopefully we'll get a conversation going and maybe have time for questions at the end. Um, the program has a very good introduction and in more detail to each of the speakers, but very briefly let me introduce our panel today. To my right uh, is uh, John Ryder who is a partner at Harris, Shelton, Hanover, and Walsh in Tennessee. And John and I uh, know each other from the Republican National Committee, where we both served on the uh, Rules Committee for the Republican Convention in 2016. John was also the general counsel of the RNC up through the recent 2016 election for several years. In 2011, John chaired both the RNC's redistricting committee and its presidential nominating schedule committees, which were uh, you know, very important committees to our uh, Republican Party. He serves as the legal counsel to the Shelby County, Tennessee Election Commission, and he has served in numerous other political roles and also serves on the board of governors of the Republican National Lawyers Association. Uh, now, Next to John is Pam Carlin, uh, who's the co-director of the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic here at Stanford and a professor at Stanford Law School. She's held numerous distinguished uh, teaching positions throughout her career. Um, I actually was a student of Professor Carlin in University of Virginia Law School. Uh, professor Carlin clerked for uh, Justice Harry Blackman on the Supreme Court. And she is one of the leading experts on voting and the political process. She served as a commissioner of the California FPPC, Fair Political Practices Commission, an assistant counsel and cooperating attorney for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, deputy assistant attorney general in the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice, where she received the attorney general's award for exceptional service. And she has done extensive work on this topic of gerrymandering. And next to Professor Carlin is uh, Professor Richard Hazen from the uh, University of California, Irvine, where he is the Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Science. He's a nationally recognized expert on election law and campaign finance regulation, and is the co-author of a leading case book on election law, and as well as uh, he just told me before the break, digging into a number of other legal issues as well, and books. His op-eds and commentaries have appeared in many publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Politico and Slate. He is well known for the often quoted election law blog, which the American Bar Association Journal named to its blog 100 Hall of Fame in 2015. <laughs> B-L-A-W-G is how that is spelled. And um, next to him finally is uh, Ben Ginsburg of Jones Day in DC. He is a nationally known political law advocate with 30 years of experience representing participants in the political process. His clients have included political parties, political campaigns, candidates, members of Congress and state legislatures, governors, corporations, trade associations, PACs, vendors, donors, and individuals. You name it in the political world, Ben has been involved in and given advice at some level. He has also been uh, active on the RNC as a, a lawyer and has been the two-time counsel to Romney for president in 2008 and 2012 very distinguished panel to discuss what we decided to discuss here on this panel. Let's focus on gerrymandering cases before the Supreme Court, what's at stake, and what we can expect out of the current term. And I'll give you a little bit of a thumbnail background. For nearly three decades, partisan gerrymandering by legislatures has become the norm in the United States, due to what some would argue is an absence of manageable standards to prevent this practice. Some people think there's no problem, so that's one of the things that we'll be talking about today. The current rules of thumb from the courts are that gerrymandered district lines are acceptable if they do not dilute the voting power of minority groups and do not violate the one person, one vote rule. Shaw versus Reno in 1993 in the Supreme Court taught us that lines based primarily on racial considerations are unconstitutional. So challenges to gerrymandering lines have been focused on challenging majority minority districts on an equal protection theory. Supreme Court in 2016, December, heard two cases based on the Shaw theory analysis challenging lines in Virginia and North Carolina. In each of these cases, the lines were drawn based on certain racial voting pattern assumptions, 
without considering potential crossover votes from other communities. In the Virginia case, the Supreme Court upheld the three judge panel's determination to leave the lines in place, rejecting a Republican challenge. In the North Carolina case, the Supreme Court struck down the lines for two districts on the grounds of racially drawn lines. In this term, in the Supreme Court, we got a couple of high profile cases. Gill versus Whitford is a case brought by Wisconsin Democrats, challenging lines drawn by Republicans in the legislature. In that case, the three judge panel below determined that Wisconsin's plan was an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander because it resulted in excessive partisan asymmetry, not explained by reference to neutral factors such as political topography. And we have some smart people here to explain what that means exactly. Um, Wisconsin appealed, and this is an equal protection case challenging the entire districting scheme for the whole state of Wisconsin. Meanwhile, in Maryland, the case of Menasek versus Lamone challenges an overt political gerrymander in 2010, in which case the Democratic legislature successfully eliminated one of two safe Republican seats in the 10 district state. Last August, the three judge panel rejected the plaintiff's request, and the plaintiffs were seven Republicans who had voted in the previous Republican district that got eliminated to redraw the lines in time for the 2018 election. A week later, the plaintiffs appealed and sought expedited consideration in the Supreme Court so that the case could be heard with that Wisconsin case I just mentioned, but the court initially declined without comment. Then the court changed its mind and decided to hear the case after all. This is a First Amendment challenge, not a 14th Amendment challenge, challenging the single district that was redrawn to force Republicans out of voting power. And there is also a retaliation theory articulated by the plaintiffs as well, that basically Republicans were being punished for voting Republican. So in Wisconsin, the court is considering a Republican gerrymander, alleged Republican gerrymander on equal protection. And in the Maryland case, it's the Republicans who are complaining. The court could use this pair of cases to make new law about the boundaries of political gerrymandering. That's the backdrop. So we're gonna start with a few questions for our panelists and a opening question is, what should the Supreme Court do with the gerrymandering cases before the court? And then the companion question is, what do you think they will do? Let's start with, uh, um, let's start with John. All right. Well, thank you, Harvey. Uh, uh, first of all, let me correct one thing. It's not just three decades of gerrymandering. It's closer to three centuries. Uh, because gerrymandering goes back to colonial America and colonial practices. This has been going on a very long time. So what I would encourage everybody to do is to sit back, take a very deep breath, exhale. Uh, this is not a crisis of democracy. Uh, this too shall pass. Now, what should the court do? Um, you know, I actually... Um, I teach as an adjunct at Vanderbilt, and I put this question on my exam. I asked them, what should the court do, and uh, what will the court do? And they, they split out about three ways, and about a third of them said, the court should definitely hold uh, uh, that uh, political gerrymandering is non-justiciable. And about a third said, the court should definitely hold that uh, these uh, gerrymanders are unconstitutional. And about a third said, well, they should do what Justice Kennedy did in Veith and say, to paraphrase uh, St. Augustine, you know, make me chaste, but not yet, uh, and, and reach the point that, yes, they are justiciable, but there is not a judicially manageable standard presented in this case and leave us exactly where we were before this term began. I'll defer to the next speaker. Okay. Professor Carlin, what do you think the court should do? So it, the, John is absolutely right that we've had three centuries of gerrymandering, but gerrymandering has changed in some important ways recently, and some of those are the product of technology. Um, so, for example, when the Supreme Court uh, addressed this question of should they do something about partisan gerrymandering in the Davis against Bandemer case in 1986, Justice O'Connor, who thought the court should stay out, said, look, there's essentially a self-regulating or limiting principle on gerrymandering, which is the more thinly you slice the bologna, the more risk you have that it will blow up in your face. I know, block that metaphor. <laughs> um, but her idea was that, you know, the way that gerrymandering works is there are basically two big techniques, packing and cracking. 
So what you do is you pack as many of your opponents into as few districts as you can, and you let them win those districts 100 to nothing. And that leaves all the rest of the districts better for you. Or you break up concentrations of your opponents, and they turn out to be ineffectual numerical minorities in every district. The techniques of gerrymandering have changed dramatically because of the same things that you've been reading about in the paper with you know, Cambridge Analytica and like, which is now the computational power allows for much more effective gerrymandering that, that doesn't have quite the same risk-reward trade-off. So what the Supreme Court is looking at now is not your grandfather's gerrymanders. They are much more effective, uh, and because uh, America is much more politically polarized today, you see many fewer of the kinds of gerrymanders that the court saw a lot of in the 70s and 80s, which were basically incumbent protective gerrymanders. And now what you see is really partisan gerrymanders in which the two political parties go after each other. It's hard, I think, for the Supreme Court to stay out of this, in part because at least the last time the court looked at this, in Vith against Jubilee, it seemed to me that all nine justices agreed that it was constitutionally troubling to have a system in which, rather than the voters electing the representatives, the representatives chose their voters. So the court faces tremendous pressure to step in. But it also faces two huge hurdles, one of which I think John already identified, that is, is there a manageable standard? And the other of which is a little bit inside baseball, but important to understand, which is, Generally, the Supreme Court has complete control over its docket. It decides whether it wants to hear a case or not. And they can dodge a case either because they think it's incredibly fact-intensive or because it's not important nationwide or because they thought the lower court got it right and they just don't have to address it. When it comes to political gerrymanders that involve state legislatures or congressional districts, though, the Supreme Court has mandatory appellate jurisdiction, which means they have to hear the cases if the cases are properly teed up. And the last thing in the world the Supreme Court wants to do is spend each decade hearing a decade's worth of redistricting cases. So they face, I think, competing pressures here. One is to come up with a manageable standard that they don't have to do anything about, because otherwise they recognize that stepping out of this, uh, stepping out of this area altogether will lead to tremendous amounts of political gerrymandering. So I think they're going to try and come up with something that at least allows them to say something that will dampen the amount of political gerrymandering. What that will be is anyone's guess. Uh, you didn't mention what happened at the oral argument in, in Benisek, but it's worth mentioning to people who haven't read the oral argument transcript, which was, you know, they, they heard oral argument in the Wisconsin case in uh, October. In March, they heard oral arguments in the Benisek case. And Justice Breyer said, well, how about if we just put these cases over, we re-argue them next term, we call in everybody, we put up a whiteboard in the court courtroom, and we just try and solve this whole thing, which is, <laughs> to go back to the Reform Party uh, analogy that Michael mentioned earlier, we'll just put up the hood and we'll just fix it. Um, and we all, know how well, we all know how well that worked, but it suggests that they're really struggling over what standard to use and how to apply it to the cases in front of them. Right, and I, I think they obviously don't want to spend their entire docket uh, every year doing this, and we're about to have another census coming up. And so it, we're, we're talking about gerrymandering from the 2010 election now in the Supreme Court in 2018. So sure. it could easily consume the docket if they don't put out some management. I mean, and, and, sure. and, and, just, yeah. Yeah, and Justice Breyer's uh, reference was to the third case that's hanging out there in the wind, wings, uh, the Ruka case from North, North Carolina. Carolina. Yeah. And, you know, then you had in the, while this was all pending, you had the Pennsylvania case, which went through the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and um, the uh, losers sought an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, which was denied. Uh, I remember in reading the transcript of the argument in Whitford, and Justice Gorsuch made the point that if justiciability is recognized for this cause of action, it will mean that the Supreme Court is involved. I think his word was, you know, every district, every election, every cycle. But, and you know, one of the things, just to point out, and this goes back to something that Harmeet said at the very beginning, is if the Supreme Court declares political gerrymandering non-justiciable, that does not mean these cases go away. What it means is each of these cases gets litigated using some other doctrine. 
So you have the people claiming one person, one vote with regard to infinitesimal differences. You have Voting Rights Act cases in which the two major political parties are litigating. And the Shaw Doctrine has become completely a doctrine about political gerrymandering and not really about race anymore. So the Supreme Court's in there one way or the other. I don't want to deprive any of the other participants, right. but I do want to say, you know, but that's the Lario's case. Yeah. And, and what's wrong with that? Well, we'll talk about that later. Um, so, <laughs> Professor Hazen, what, what should the court do? It's, it's Hassan. Hassan, sorry. It's on the current show. Um, so, uh, I was going to lead with what Pam did, which is Justice O'Connor talking about the self-limiting enterprise of gerrymandering, and I'd say things changed in three ways. Pam mentioned one of them, technology. And so, there's a, a great amicus brief supporting neither party by, uh, in the uh, Gill case by Professors Groffman and Gaddy making the point that uh, it's now possible to uh, draw a gerrymander that's effective for an entire decade, where it used to not be possible to do that because of shifts of population and, and changes. That it really takes a wave election to get over this, and you can have a much more effective gerrymander than you used to have before. So technology is one difference from when Justice O'Connor wrote in the 1980s about the self-limiting enterprise. A second difference is polarization. Um, uh, yes, political parties have been fighting, but they've been fighting uh, uh, much more uh, viciously uh, in the last few decades, in part thanks to the transformation in the South uh, with conservatives leaving the Democratic Party and going to the Republican Party. And so to uh, reference what happened in North Carolina, which John just mentioned, um, after North Carolina's congressional districts were struck down as a racial gerrymander, North Carolina went in and drew new congressional districts and they didn't uh, look at any racial data. And in a state that's 50-50, they drew 10 of 13 congressional districts to be safe Republican districts. And the, uh, one of the legislative leaders in the North Carolina General Assembly, David Lewis, was asked in a 50-50 state, why did you draw 10 of 13 as uh, Republican? And he said, because I couldn't figure out how to draw an 11th as a Republican. <laughs> and so I think this is the future. And so. Uh, 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 gerrymander, and, and the only reason I think that Republicans do it more than Democrats is because Republicans control more legislatures than Democrats do. Um, so this has become somewhat of a partisan issue just because I think right now Republicans control more uh, uh, state legislatures. But I think this is an equal opportunity uh, kind of offense. So three changes, technology, polarization, and the third is the one that John and Pam were alluding to a few minutes ago, which is the race or party question, especially in the American South. Uh, there's such an overlap of um, race and party where uh, minority voters are overwhelmingly supporting the Democratic Party. Uh, over 90% of African Americans are reliable Democratic voters. More than two-thirds of whites are uh, Republican voters. In states like that, if you don't have uh, a doctrine that deals with um, uh, political gerrymandering, these cases are going to be litigated as Voting Rights Act cases and as racial gerrymandering cases. And we can get into this more, but as Pam said, the racial gerrymandering cases have become a vehicle for going after both partisan gerrymandering and vote dilution that is not significant enough to um, uh, be uh, a violation of the Voting Rights Act. So those three factors mean that things are different. And the most important factor, which we didn't explicitly mention yet, is Justice Kennedy. Justice Kennedy was the swing vote in the Veith case. Uh, he's been the swing vote on this issue. It was clear from uh, the oral argument in the second case, which uh, the Benesek case, which came months after the oral argument in the Gill case, that the court is still struggling with this. That might mean that Kennedy still had not made up his mind. The Gill case was argued October 3rd, and we'll be lucky if we get an opinion in June. Justice Kennedy knows that he's not going to be on the court forever, even if he decides to stay for a few more terms. And if he's looking to make a move here, this is the time to do it. Uh, uh, I don't know if he's going to, but I think if he looks ahead at what's going on in North Carolina and what happened in some other states, uh, he might realize that things are going to get a lot worse and this may be the last best chance to rein in gerrymandering with some kind of um, uh, tool that might appeal to him. So Ben, what are your thoughts? What should the Supreme Court do? Well, um, I, I, I sort of feel uh, about this on the subject of gerrymandering generally, and certainly after hearing the three of you, um, which is uh, everything there is to, to be said about gerrymandering has been said, just not by everybody. So as the fourth speaker, let me dive kind of right into that. 
I should also self-confess that after um, being involved in redistricting on state levels, we had to name our family dog. And I was insistent that our beloved pooch for many years be named gerrymander. So I feel that getting rid of the, of, of the ability to gerrymander would somehow defy her, mem her memory. And uh, uh, so I think um, that, that sort of the biases that I, I bring to the, to the whole process. Um, it's interesting to me about gerrymandering, and certainly the court is considering this as it, as it deals with the two cases, in seeing the shifting standards and the shifting political parties' thoughts about gerrymandering. The first case I did was the Batham case, or worked on a little bit, was the Batham case in California in the 1980s. It was a challenge to Phil Burton's masterful uh, gerrymander of this state that included one district with 384 sides to it, some massive number. That was a masterful gerrymandering, old technology or, or new technology. At that point, the Republicans were really, really upset about the principle of gerrymandering, and the Democrats were sort of saying, man, not so bad. Voting Rights Act came across in the 1990s. That caused um, a great reset in the way drawers had to think about their ability to gerrymander and the way they would draw districts. But that was the sea change that caused the result. As, um, as the court is well aware, Republicans have done better in state elections over the last three decades. Um, Republicans have taken advantage of the ability to, to gerrymander because of election results. And it really is election results that, that the ultimate driver of how political parties think about whether gerrymandering's good or gerrymandering's bad. So if you are the Supreme Court, you would have to come up with some standards that is actually going to be applied in all the different states. What's interesting to me about the two cases is that if you look at Wisconsin, there are no 384-sided districts there. They're actually pretty neat, clean districts, yet they're up for a challenge at the Supreme Court. The Maryland case, on the other hand, is all about one congressional district, and that is really one really, really ugly district um, that takes every Shaw standard you have and throws it, throws it to the wind. So if you're the court, can you actually come up with a standard that's used by both Republicans and Democrats to draw maps for what particular ideal is not really clear? Because at the end of the day, I love analyzing all the cases and coming up with what are principles involved. But I think the reason that the court is going to struggle to come up with a meaningful standard that can actually be applied is that this stuff comes down to election results. That there is art and beauty in judicial precedent, but the reality of the way those things are implemented <coughs> comes down to politics, which is why the court's going to, I think, going to have a really tough time coming up with anything that, that's going to work. Now, the Republicans were the beneficiary of a wave election in 2010 in which they won most of those legislative seats in democratically drawn gerrymanders. In gubernatorial and elections. Yeah. So a lot of our discussion here and the jurisprudence around the Voting Rights Act and the constitutional analysis is premised on the assumption that gerrymandering is bad. So. Uh, let's challenge that. Uh, Professor Carlin, what is the theory as to why gerrymandering is problematic? Is it majoritarian anti-establishment or is it the discrimination problem? So that, I, I, that's, I think, a central issue that the court has to grapple with, which is, you know, the question of what the problem is depends on whether your concern is with uh, a kind of partisan asymmetry that a lot of people talk about where a party that gets a minority of the votes controls a majority of the seats consistently. Uh, that was part of what drove the court in the one person, one vote cases, which were, uh, which, where the court ultimately came up with the benefit of a test which, while it might not have a lot to do with the constitutional text, is easy to apply and everybody understands it. 
And when the court wrote the one person, one vote cases, part of what they talked about was the problem of legislative districts in states that hadn't redrawn their districts for generations, in which a small minority of the population was electing a majority of the seats. So in a lot of southern states, for example, the districts had been drawn in 1901, and they hadn't been changed as of 1961. And there had been a huge increase in the urban population, and even more in the suburban population around the big cities. And those people were terribly underrepresented relative to rural communities, which were terribly overrepresented. So there might be seven times as many people in one district as in another. Uh, or 15 times as many. And it wasn't just in the South, it was even in Connecticut, where each township, there's 69 townships in Connecticut, got one member of the state legislature, and that meant Hartford, which had uh, about 140,000 people, and it got one, and East Toland, which had like 75 people, and it got one. And the problem there was that a, major a minority could control the outcome. Well, you can now do that with equipopulous redistricting. That is, each district has the same number of people in it, but a group of people who are, say, 35 or 40 percent of the electorate consistently like 50 or 60 percent. And that's the theory, at least, in the Wisconsin case, which is when the Republicans get 40, 45 or 48 percent of the vote, they get 66 percent of the seats. And that's consistently true. And the Democrats can get 55 or 60 percent of the votes, and they still only get 45 percent of the seats. So that's one theory, that really the problem is that a majority of the people ought to be able to elect a majority of the legislature, and gerrymandering keeps them from doing that. The other theory is that this is, um, and you alluded to this in talking about Benesik, that the problem here is people are being retaliated against or being denied the ability to elect uh, a sufficient share of the legislature because of their political views. And in almost every other area in which the government acts, the government is not allowed to discriminate against people on the basis of their political views. So you can't fire somebody from a regular government job because they supported your opponent. You can't deny them government contracts because they contributed politically to your opponent. But you can essentially deny them seats in the legislature because you don't like the way they would vote. And you know, I think the law toggles back and forth between these two very different notions of what the problem with gerrymandering is. Okay, uh, Ben, is gerrymandering a problem? Uh, so again, it's something that if you looked at it in the 80s, some people thought it was a problem and they didn't think so much in the 90s and 2000s and now they do again. So it, it, it does come down, I think, to a very political question of who thinks it's bad and, um, and, and who thinks it's not. I think one of the things that you've got to take into account, and what Pam says is actually true, but there is this 40-year demographic shift in the country where people are living more with people like themselves, so that we have much more homogeneous communities today, so that in order to be able to draw competitive districts, you're going to have to draw ugly-looking districts. Uh, to the extent that you haven't. So when you're talking about gerrymandering, which is somehow, the, I guess, the artificial manipulation of election results by moving people around, what's the value you're trying to draw for? Is it to preserve communities and to have neat-looking districts because that connotates uh, neat-looking districts? Or are you trying to have competitive districts and manipulate things around for sort of a proportional representation reason Proportional representation being one of those things that nobody has ever wanted to admit to uh, since, since drawing began. Let me take that one step further, uh, Ben, is that, you know, I, th I think what you're seeing is sort of the playing out of Justice O'Connor's prophecy in uh, her dissent in uh, Bandmer, which was that any application of these formulas would lead to a rough form of proportionality. And that begins to change the fundamental nature of representation. A as you indicated, heretofore what we've had, and we all do it throughout the United States, is you know the single member geographically based district, first past the post, uh, winner, which means that the representative then represents a community that is tied together by something. Maybe a municipality, maybe a county, maybe whatever it is. And what you're talking about now is having a judicially imposed gerrymander, 
that creates districts that have a sufficient number of ideological adherents uh, to create the correct balance in the legislative body as determined by that judge. Uh, and so the basis of representation is now not the geographical community in which you live, but the ideological community with which you identify. And I think that's a fundamental shift in the nature of representation, and it's a very radical shift. I think it's, I think it's interesting that both uh, Ben and John characterize the gerrymandering harm as necessarily proportional representation. Uh, that uh, It reminds me of those... Uh, Part of the oral arguments in the Gill case where uh, the lawyer representing the challengers, uh, Paul Smith, was making an argument for the asymmetry standard that Pam's explained. And Chief Justice Roberts, who I think of as an extremely smart uh, individual, um, said he didn't understand, he called it at one point sociological gobbledygook, uh, the test, uh, um, there's, there's a test that um, McGee and Stephanopoulos have come up with called the efficiency gap, but it's a variation on other tests that have been out there to try to measure this kind of asymmetry. And I think part of the rhetoric of arguing against making um, gerrymandering justiciable is an argument that it will inevitably lead to proportional representation. And I think the big pushback has been you can have an asymmetry standard that doesn't necessarily uh, lead in that direction. And I think... Uh, that's where I thought the court was going to go after Gill. But then once they took the Benisek case, uh, it, you know, it, was, it was Justice Kennedy who in the Veith case said maybe we should think of this on First Amendment lines uh, uh, as this kind of discrimination against uh, people because of their affiliation, which does seem to lead more towards proportionality. So it really is a mystery as to where the court's going to go. But I would have thought that they would have adopted an asymmetry standard, especially because uh, if they're going to do anything, especially because you can use math uh, just like you can with the one person, one vote. And the more you make the test mechanical, the fewer cases are going to come up to the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court's going to feel like they have to have a full uh, hearing. So I think there, there's both a, 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 a question of, of um, philosophy, but there's also a question of manageability that's going to come in if the court's going to rein these things in as to what the measure is going to be. Proportionality may be an easier test, but there's philosophical resistance to it. Uh, maybe the uh, asymmetry test is the best of both worlds. How is asymmetry, does, how does asymmetry not lead to proportionality? Well, it says that if you draw a district where one party can capture 60% of the seats with 40% of the vote, the other should be able to as well. It doesn't guarantee that if you have 60% so of the votes. You an asymmetric yeah. result. Right. Well, it's a, it, asymmetric in, in opportunity to control. Symmetrical, but I, 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 asymmet yeah. symmetrical asymmetry. Yeah. But if I can go back to something you said earlier, John, um, I think one of the things we need to think about is what is representation designed to accomplish? Because yeah. part of what you were saying was the way people should be represented is based on where they live. And well, that's historically, what, that's what it's been. Right. But it was historically based that way in part because people's interests were much more closely tied to where they lived. And indeed, if you go back to the debates in 1842 over why we have single member districts for Congress, the idea was that you wanted proportionality. That is, the, 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 the debate was about it would be unfair for Philadelphia to elect all of the representatives from Pennsylvania because people in western Pennsylvania had very different interests than people in eastern Pennsylvania. Today, it may be for some kinds of elections that people's interests really are tied very closely to their geography. So for example, if you think about city council members, you want to be able to call up your city council member and say, the garbage is not being picked up in my neighborhood, or you know, the, we need to have the park fixed in my neighborhood. I wonder, though, whether when you get to congressional elections, and you're talking about districts that have 700,000 people in them, you really are representing groups of people that are defined as a community based on geography, or whether people care much more in those elections about values that are ideologically driven than values that are geographically driven. So and if that's true, then we should be thinking about that as part of what representation ought to mean. If people want to be represented because they are pro-choice and not because they work in a particular industry, then we should be thinking about how that, how that kind of representation is best accomplished. 
So explain how that would work mechanically if you're a legislator who needs to draw the map and have common interests of people across the state. Well, one way you might do it is, you know, one question is whether you really want to have single member districts as the way of electing at all. Uh. And I know people <laughs> step back and say, oh, proportional representation is a terrible thing. But actually, even when you're talking about geography, you're talking about proportional representation in a way. That is that farmers and rural people should be represented in the legislature. Also that people who are urban, also people who are suburban. I think one way to think about this is that it does lead towards a kind of proportionality, which is you should be thinking about making sure that the Democrats and the Republicans are both able to elect a fair number of people to the legislative body that's going to make the policy. And you can do that by manipulating, obviously by manipulating the lines so that you create, I think what you don't want to do is create just a, a pure set of safe districts. What you would like is a kind of distribution of districts where there are some districts for each party that are relatively safe and there are some districts that are relatively competitive so that if the population's views change, the composition of the legislature will be responsive in some ways to the changes in how people are, the changes in how people are actually voting. I'd add that um, now that the parties are, have become so separate, and so, how do I say it, the most conservative Democrat is more liberal than the most liberal Republican in Congress, that we can use party as a proxy for this ideological division. And so if you wanted to have a fair share of views reflected in your legislative body, they would be fairly reflected in the partisan makeup of the state. Well, except you have more decline to state voters than either people in, who line up as D's and R's in most states. Yeah, but it turns out that although people, there are a greater number of voters right now who are registered with neither party, you actually can predict with much greater accuracy today how people will vote than in the past. There's, there are all these people who say they're independents, but 99% of the time, each one of them predictively, predictably votes for one party or the other. Or in North Carolina, to go back to your race and politics point, um, when we were trying the North Carolina um, uh, omnibus voter restriction uh, case, uh, the state's own expert testified that uh, it was easier to predict that somebody would vote Democratic by knowing they were African American than by knowing that they were registered as a Democrat. Yeah, uh, very true. I mean, so jumping off of something that Ben said about the de demographic changes, I'd like to ask the other panelists to talk about this. How have the demographic changes in the last four decades, which has resulted in you know, the, gro the growth of suburbia, some more homogenous communities, affected the ability of legislatures to draw competitive districts? Well, what data has shown us over the past decade, and it's been greatly refined through the campaign process, is that lifestyle choices tend to be very good predictors of electoral choices. So the guy who drives a pickup truck and has a hunting license is more likely to be a Republican than a Democrat, <laughs> uh, to pick a good Tennessee example. Uh, but uh, so you know that, but that really kind of goes, this big sort phenomena, uh, which was identified by Bill Bishop in his book by that title, uh, which is, if you haven't read it, it is a great read and it really explains the, and describes this phenomenon. A lot of people have updated his data and brought it forward and uh, the political scientists now refer to it as spatial polarization, uh, self-sorting of the American public by lifestyle, which tends again to be a predictor of political behavior. But that goes to the point that Pam is making, which is, if you know this, then you can actually draw geographic <laughs> districts that reflect the ideology. So there's no reason you can't come out in the same place um, using geography and still preserving the historic nature of um, community-based representation. Professor Hassan? You know, I was going to say that uh, one of the things uh, that flows from the concentration of Democrats in big cities is that um, it's harder to, it's harder for Democrats to draw a gerrymander that actually works compared to Republicans because there's only so much spreading out yeah. voters that you can do. Yeah, we and, huddle for warmth. <laughs> and so, so one of the, <laughs> one of the questions that's come up <laughs> with these various tests yeah. of yeah. asymmetry yeah. Right uh, yeah. that, the, that the court's been, uh, asked to look at as a potential way of reigning and gerrymandering is 
how do you separate out the kind of the natural geography and concentration of people f versus uh, what is being done for political manipulation? And so there are some uh, social science tests to try to tease that out. But that's that 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 issue had, has come up in uh, in these court cases, and, and the, um, uh, the social scientists are trying to grapple with uh, how to explain how much beyond. Uh, what would naturally be occurring based on people self-sorting uh, would be occurring uh, in drawing a fair legislative set but, of lines. But, but <laughs> um, if the purpose of the exercise is to separate sort of the ordinary garden variety gerrymander from the extreme gerrymander, then I'm not sure that the tools, and, and I really liked Professor Carlin's amicus brief in Whitford. Except I reach a different conclusion. I was not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I think all of those ordinary tools are sufficient to eliminate the extreme cases. And so that you can get so in Larios, you could reach a result that undid a vicious democratic gerrymander in the state of Georgia uh, simply by using one person, one vote um, uh, logic. Professor Carlin, what, what's your view on this demographic shift issue? So uh, there are a couple of different demographic shifts, and the one that I just want to mention briefly is also the increasing rise of the share of the electorate in a number of states who are uh, uh, Latino. Because I think that's also part of what's driving some of this is a concern. And, and this plays out more not just in the redistricting, but in another set of voting cases, which are the ones that deal with um, uh, restrictions on the ability of people to cast a ballot and have that ballot counted. Um, if you looked at, to go back to something Michael was saying earlier, if you look at just the Constitution, you would think we have a triumphal story of increase, ever increasing amounts of democracy in the United States. I mean, at the framing, uh, people couldn't vote because they were female. They couldn't vote because they were African American. They couldn't vote because they didn't own property or pay property taxes or the like. All of those things have been eliminated. So if you look at the Constitution itself, there's this kind of triumphal story of ever increasing numbers of people voting. If you actually look at the law on the ground, you'll see that it's cyclical in American history. Uh, more uh, African American men as a percentage of uh, African American turnout voted in the 1876 and 1880 presidential elections than voted again until 2008. So you had huge cycles. And one of the things that you're seeing now is because of one person, one vote, and concerns with one person, one vote, uh, there's incre increased, um, increased restrictions, voter ID laws, voter purge laws, and the like. Because in states where the uh, Latino population is growing dramatically, in part, and this is, this is a modern phenomenon, in part because of anti-immigration related policies by the Republican Party, it's turned the Latino vote, which might otherwise have been uh, pretty evenly split between the Democratic and Republican parties into a heavily Democratic vote. That's why California is no longer really a two-party state, because of Prop 187, which drove the entire uh, immigrant population of California as they became citizens into voting for the Democratic Party. Well, not the entire. So. Well, I know. There's you. But otherwise. Um, and I'm a Republican in San Francisco, so I'm clearly a phenomenon of the wasted vote I, I, there. So. People come to see you from miles around. People take their children to say, look. There's one. There's one. Free range. Because this is California. Free range and organic. And endangered. Um, and endangered. And endangered. Um, but but seriously. Um, uh, so there are these demographic shifts, and one of the ones that I think you're going to see uh, looking forward to the 2020 uh, ele elections is this question of who gets counted in the apportionment base. So uh, you, may be, you may be familiar with this, that the census is uh, going to ask a question about whether people are citizens. And that question won't determine how the seats get allocated to the states in Congress, because that's a total population number. That's actually in the text of the Constitution. It's inhabitants, not citizens, and not even just inhabitants legally present in the country. But once you get those seats, the question of how to draw those districts is one 
in which I think we're going to see a different kind of one person, one vote arguments. We saw this up at the Supreme Court a little bit in the Evanwell against Abbott case uh, two terms ago about whether you should equalize the number of citizens of voting age in each district versus the total population of inhabitants of each district. And that has obvious political consequences for the way uh, the way the districts are drawn. Oh, I see that John is itch itching to jump in on this issue. Well, Pant <laughs> positively panting to jump in. <laughs> the, um, the, the citizenship question is going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. And Pam is absolutely right. Uh, the census, the uh, apportionment of seats among the states uh, has to be done according to total population. But we have this concept called citizen voting age population or citizen population, CVAP, and you start to get into all the, the uh, jargon of redistricting uh, when you talk about this subject. Um, I think it is going to be possible with the kind of technology we have now to draw districts, certainly at the legislative level uh, and possibly at the congressional level, uh, that will produce equipopulous districts uh, under both standards, both a TPOP and a CVAP standard. Those districts will lack all coherence to them because the way you would do that in Texas is by taking areas of the state that are high Latino, low citizen of voting age population and linking them to areas of the state that are high Anglo populations and every district will be a microcosm of the state. And well, you, yeah, you've, but you've got different areas. In, in the valley in Texas, it's high Latino, high citizenship. Yeah. Right. It, in, but you'll have in to, Houston, right, you'll you have, have to a different link situation. Those, you'll have to link the district. I mean, I looked into this when, when I, I was at DOJ when uh, Abbott against Evanwell, Evanwell against Abbott was being argued. And the, the interesting thing to me was that the challengers in that case would, they, they, they filed an affidavit from their, their social scientists saying, we can draw districts that, that equalize both TPOP and CVAP, so total population and citizens voting age. They would not show anybody what those districts looked yeah. like. And the reason I think they would not show anybody that is if you actually tried to draw those districts, you would have to link parts of West Texas to Houston. And if you've ever seen a map of Texas, you'd know Houston is from your perspective over here, and West Texas is over here, and vice versa. Uh, ben, did you want to add anything to your uh, question you proposed? Well, the I think what Pam, what Pam talks about is true, but it also points out how difficult it is for the Supreme Court to come up with a standard that meets all the criteria we're all talking about. And furthermore, that wouldn't be, pardon the expression, gained by wily political operatives who are actually drawing the maps in 2021 and 2022. So that if you come up with a standard like that or a mathematical standard, it will be tested in the laboratory of 50 states trying to redistrict, and it's not going to come out the same way for 2030 that it went in in 2020. And that's, yeah. no, that's the, the sure. challenge. And that, yeah, which raises again the point that and then all these cases go before the Supreme Court because they're direct appeals from a three-judge panel. So um, I want to go back to a point that we, uh, I think it was uh, Pam mentioned earlier, that on this panel we're talking about political gerrymandering, but uh, historically there's been a lot of analysis of racial gerrymandering. And in the American South and other parts or pockets of our country, race and party have overlapped historically very significantly. Though that may be starting to change, we've seen the phenomenon just this month with Kanye West and the kind of the, his uh, support of President Trump on some stuff, and then a backlash. I think you know Republicans are certainly hoping that that grip is starting to fade. But how does this intersection of race and party affect redistricting analysis under both the Voting Rights Act and the Constitution? Uh, I'll start with this one. Uh, so uh, the overlap of race and party is most pronounced in the American South. Uh, there was a poll done a month before the election, uh, the Elon poll, which is a very well-respected poll in North Carolina, and there was not a single African-American respondent who uh, said they were going to vote for Trump. Uh, so Kanye aside, I don't see a, a large movement uh, among the African-American community towards uh, the Republican Party. Um, I have met some, so uh, they do exist. Uh, so uh, 
we know that in, uh, intentionally diluting vote on the basis of race violates the Constitution. Uh, uh, this is something I said. Uh, we know that uh, under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, under certain circumstances, a, a racially discriminatory effect in drawing district lines uh, uh, is illegal and requires the redrawing of those lines. And we know since the 1990s uh, that um, making race the predominant factor in drawing your district lines um, without an adequate justification violates equal protection clause. And so this has presented the kind of uh, Goldilocks problem, I think Ben has talked about this, where you have to take race into account enough but not too much. And it's a question of how you do that. Um, with the um, uh, overlap of race and party, especially in the American South, what we saw in the last decade were Republican legislatures drawing district lines that packed reliably Democratic voters who happened to be minorities into a smaller number of districts, claiming they had to do it because the Voting Rights Act made them do it. Uh, this is the only way to solve the Voting Rights Act problem. And what was pretty remarkable at the Supreme Court in the last term, especially in the Cooper case uh, coming out of North Carolina, is that the Supreme Court uh, rejected uh, that. Uh, and we saw it earlier in the, the uh, term, term before, I think it was, in the Alabama case, where uh, Republican legislatures tried to justify the packing of African American voters into districts on the basis of um, uh, complying with the Voting Rights Act. And the court said, no, you've made race the predominant factor. What's interesting in all of these new cases is that when the racial gerrymandering cases started, they were brought by conservatives who were looking for a colorblind constitution. And they've now been, uh, uh, it's, it's a flip, and you now have Democrats and uh, minority voting rights groups using this as a tool to stop Republican partisan gerrymandering, which also has a racial component. And so uh, at oral arguments in the North Carolina case, Paul Clement, who was defending what North Carolina did, called them junior varsity vote dilution claims. So they're not enough dilution to violate Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, but are enough dilution to count here. Maybe that's what's going on, or maybe it is, as I think Pam suggested in her opening remarks, that this is the way that the court is now policing some partisan <laughs> gerrymandering without using the term partisan gerrymandering. And if the court stays out in the two cases it's hearing this term on partisan gerrymandering, I expect at least in the parts of the United States with significant minority populations and Republican legislatures, you're going to see a lot more racial gerrymandering uh, claims being brought. I don't know if Pam, if that jobs what you think. You Pam, no, please. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Uh, well, I'm not going to dispute the Elon survey, and I'm not going to dispute that um, uh, Trump underperformed significantly in the African American community. Uh, however, as the only Southerner on this panel, I will say that the concept of racial black voting has eroded significantly over the past decade. Now, I, I live in a community in which we have a majority African American congressional district that is represented by a liberal Democratic white congressman, uh, a majority African American city that is represented by a moderate Democrat mayor. We have had a majority white county which successfully elected uh, a moderate African American Democrat mayor that um, Republicans at the local level uh, routinely get a significant 25 to 35 percent of the African American vote that there is, and you know, African American Democrats routinely get a significant crossover vote from the white community. So I'm just going to su suggest to you that at least one of the Jingles preconditions no longer exists at the local level, at least where I live. Professor Carla, I mean, it's it's worth noting that to say that you know, 25 percent of black voters are voting for, the, for uh, a white candidate or that 25% of white voters are voting for a black candidate, we would say that those are landslide margins. That is, the, the level of racial black voting has certainly gone down since the 1970s, but that we still have racial black voting in the country is undeniable, I think. 
Uh, and the other thing that I think is interesting here, and this takes us back to the original Constitution, is race has always been hugely important and hugely tied to how we think about redistricting and representation back to the three-fifths clause, up through the 14th Amendment and the reduction of representation clause, which is one of my, uh, one of my candidates for most interesting part of the Constitution that's never been enforced or talked about. I mean, now that we're talking about emoluments, this may be the only thing left uh, to, to, to talk about next. But, you know, the, 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 the racial issues in the United States and their salience for politics uh, have remained constant, although the issue, the particular issues have changed over time. They've remained quite salient over the entire course of our history, and I don't see anything that suggests they're going to disappear anytime soon. Well, let me suggest one thing that, that may make it disappear a bit, which is not the, the overlying principle that you're talking about, but it is the, the more sophisticated map drawing abilities that you also talked about, and the ability to find surrogates for race in advanced data will be available to map drawers. So I believe that people who draw maps will have learned the lessons from the defeats you talked about at the Supreme Court and be able to find other things in the much more sophisticated databases they have so that as you are justifying where you put a line, you will not have to use race in the manner that you used to. Yeah, although the interesting thing, I, th I agree with you 100%, but one of the interesting things about this though is think about what people say about what they're doing and how that comports with our understanding of democracy. So I'll just tell a little story from uh, the 2000 round of redistricting here in California, I was doing, uh, handling compliance uh, for the state legislature, compliance with Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. So they would bring me into a room, they'd show me the map, I'd look at the map and I'd say, you know, that line looks a little bit hinky uh, given the underlying racial data, you know, because it was separating the Latino area from an Anglo area or the like. I'd say, do we have an explanation for why that line is there? And the guy who was the, the political guy would look at me with great sincerity and say things like, well, on that side of the line, it's a tree growing crop. And on this side of the line, it's a ground growing crop. And he, then he'd nod. <laughs> and I'd think to myself, okay. I mean, and there actually are things connected <laughs> with that geographically. But saying, we drew this line not because of race, but we drew this line based on uh, what television shows people watch is going to look to the average person out there as if it's being manipulated in a really in a way that shouldn't that it shouldn't be manipulated. So one of the things is the story we tell ourselves about why we're drawing the lines we're drawing is often really important to people's sense of whether the process was legitimate. The, the yeah, but the the way the justifications will work. So you you came in. First of all, your map's always got upheld in California. So even the... the I was really good at what I did. <laughs> and those explanations were really good about why the lines got drawn. Yeah, you. I learned a lot about tree growing versus ground growing crops. <clears throat> yeah, and if, 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 I mean, the point is if you look at the data today, there are, there are going to be ways that clever map drawers will, will find that are less superficial than that, that they'll be able to impose through a statewide map uh, for some consistency. And the richness of the stories the, um, the evil map drawers draw will have much more nuance to them. So this was touched on before, I think, by a couple of our speakers. But given Evanwell and disputes over the citizenship question on the census coming up, to what extent are we likely to see citizen-based or voter-based as opposed to person-based drawing of district lines in the next redistricting 2020 and beyond? It's going to vary hugely from state to yeah. state. That is, I think um, the vast majority of states in the country and, and the vast majority of jurisdictions, because you're talking about drawing school board districts and city council districts as well as state legislative and congressional districts, are going to stick with total population. Uh, but there are going to be some areas of the country, I think particularly areas of the country where there is an exploding Latino population and there is a good deal of racial tension over it, where the pressure to draw um, citizen voting age population districts is going to be huge. I mean, just to give you a kind of prediction, the kinds of places that started passing anti-immigration ordinances, especially the ones like, for example, you know, I, what, what was it, Farmer's Branch? 
I think in Texas where they wanted to make it illegal to rent property to somebody who was in the country without documentation. Places like that are going to want to draw their districts for city council and the like using citizens of voting age population. Because if you don't think these people should be entitled even to live in your community, you're not going to think that they are entitled to a share of the representation in the community. Yeah, As whereas opposed in San to maintaining Francisco. the representation based on total population right. where you create what are essentially rotten boroughs that are districts that have the equal number of total uh, population but have a fraction of the voting population because you have a substantial non-citizen population. But it's interesting which is similar, people, similar, yeah, similar yeah. to the prison issue. Right, I was going to say, yeah, you, none of yeah. these people say that. I mean, it's really interesting, the asymmetry. That is, people who say, yeah. you should draw all the districts based on citizens of voting age, but my rotten borough, which has a bunch of prisons in it of people right. who were sent to my part of the state involuntarily, who can't right. vote, and who can't vote me out of office. I mean, there was this great quote from one of the upstate Republican state legislators in New York who said, I love having prisons in my district because you don't have to, they can't vote you out of office and you don't have to answer their mail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Professor Hayson. I was just going to go back to, um, we were talking about the citizenship question on the census. And um, you know, we're talking about it doesn't affect apportionment among the states. Well, that's true, direct, uh, but it could affect um, how the districts are drawn once yeah. it's apportioned. That, that's true directly, but may not be true indirectly. That is, um, most uh, questions on the census go through an extensive round of testing to make sure that the questions are fairly worded and people understand them and they can respond to them. The citizenship question was thrown at the last minute, I would say on the pretext that uh, the Department of Justice came up with that they needed better data uh, to litigate uh, Voting Rights Act cases involving Latinos. Um, but there's at least a suspicion that it's going to suppress the uh, counting of people. People are not going to, even if they are citizens, uh, they might be in a neighborhood where um, they know of other non-citizens, they might worry about if there are other non-citizens, they're gonna be asked about them. So it may in fact depress, and it may even depress in a place like Texas, um, uh, not just a place like California with a, with a democratic lean. It may affect the denominator, it may affect the counting and that counting is important, not only for the apportionment of the congressional seats among the states, it's also important for federal funding. And so, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it may be if Democrats take control of the House that they end up being able to block that citizenship question. I don't think that it's completely done. But I think there are going to be a lot of ramifications that have not been fully thought through on this uh, question. I certainly agree with that. I think one of the issues that will get litigated one way or another is this very issue. I mean, it'll be back up to the Supreme Court at some point. Oh, yeah, Evan will, or even will, uh, uh, too, is certainly uh, on its way. Right, and I, uh, just for those who are not familiar with that case, the, the argument in the Evan well case was that um, districting must be done on the basis of equal number of citizens, and the Supreme Court said no. Um, uh, but left open the question whether it could be done on the basis of equal number of citizens as opposed to equal numbers of people. And I count at least two justices who were on the court then, uh, Thomas, uh, who are still on the court now, Thomas and Alito, uh, as uh, justices who uh, seemed at least open to the possibility that citizenship-based line drawing would be constitutional. And that would have tremendous, m much greater effects on representation in cities and states with large minority populations than the kind of gerrymandering that we're talking about now. And I, I think it's also true that there will not be consistency among the states, that people drawing maps will run the numbers under any of the possible tests, see which ones they choose to use and will, and it's just not going to be consistent. Similar to uh, Professor Carlin's comment about prisons, which is already being done for purposes of uh, of legislative redistricting. There are some states in which uh, the legislature uh, chooses it um, desirable to repatriate the prisoners to their last known address prior to incarceration for purposes of calculating the population for legislative redistricting. Um, and others where they find it more convenient to count them where they're uh, being kept at government expense. 
Okay, so one final question. We can then, if we have time, we can have a couple of questions from the audience. But um, if the court doesn't definitively rule in the Wisconsin and the Maryland cases, or either one of them, what's going to be next in terms of the development of the law of uh, gerrymandering? Do we have cases coming up in the uh, other courts that may be taken up by the court next uh, next term? Uh, John? Much more important than the courses, uh, cases coming up in the next uh, term of the Supreme Court is what Ben referred to. There's going to be an election in November, and that's going to change the political landscape. And then uh, the party whose ox is being gored may change. And I think the rhetoric surrounding this issue will change if uh, different parties have different majorities in different states. Uh, if the court declines to act either on jurisdictional grounds, standing grounds, uh, ripeness grounds uh, in these cases and, and punch the issue, um, then the remedy for this goes to a political process. First, elections. Second, commissions. And you've seen a lot of citizen initiatives throughout the country uh, promoting the idea of creating redistricting commissions. Uh, third, state constitutional litigation such as you saw in Pennsylvania. Uh, fourth, state constitutional standards such as were imposed in Florida. Uh, although the Florida standard says the legislature cannot pass a redistricting plan which advantages or disadvantages either party. Now think about that a minute and think about how you draw a line that doesn't help or hurt anyone. Um, and then, you know, fifth, Congress could actually step in, as it has on numerous occasions in the past. Uh, again, Professor Carlin referred to 1842, which was the first apportionment act adopted by the Congress under the Elections Clause of Article I, Section 4 of the Constitution. Congress has the right to adopt regulations regarding the time, place, and manner of uh, elections and could do so. In 1842, it abolished, Congress abolished at large uh, statewide elections for congressional delegations and required single member districts. Uh, in a subsequent apportionment act, 1911, I believe, um, and I think this was carried over in the 29 Act, uh, the apportionment act required compactness and contiguity as uh, features of congressional districts. And I believe they have the same power under the Section 5 of the 14th Amendment uh, to do to exercise their control in the legislative arena as well. Professor Hassan? Uh, a couple of things. First, um, there is a, a, just the immediate case that's pending is that North Carolina case. And when Justice Breyer said to bring out the whiteboard, which he had suggested, right. he wanted to bring that case in too. He was imagining the lawyers from the North Carolina case, the Wisconsin case, and the uh, Maryland case, all in the court together, uh, with the Supreme Court kind of working it out, uh, talking it through, a kind of brainstorming session. Uh, he didn't seem to have a lot of takers uh, from the rest of the members of the court. But, but that North Carolina case is going to have to be disposed of one way or the other. Uh, it might get sent back based on what happens in these other cases, or, or it might not. Uh, but on to John's point about Congress, I remember in the early 2000s, I was at an event at, uh, I think it was at Brookings, and Barack Obama was a, state, uh, was a US senator then. And he was railing against gerrymandering and uh, all of the things. And I asked the question, I said, how about Congress stepping in and coming up with some standards? And he said, no, that's for the courts to do. And I think things have only gotten worse in terms of polarization since that, that was maybe in 2002, 2000, 2004. I can't remember exactly uh, what year that was. Um, but things have gotten worse. It's hard to imagine. Democrats, Republicans coming together and coming up with fair standards on redistricting. Yeah. So while the Constitution certainly gives Congress the ability to do that, I completely agree, although I'm not so sure everyone would agree that it gives Congress the power to do this for state legislative lines, I can't imagine the political circumstances today are such that that kind of legislation is going to emerge out of Congress, especially before the next round of redistricting, which is going to be incredibly important. As they all are. Yeah. Um, I think it's highly unlikely that Congress would come up with a set of standards for redistricting, I mean, especially since each one of the members, at least at the House, sees a special expertise that he or she has that, that makes it pretty tough to come up with the standards. And I think the cases from 2021 and 2022 
are the ones that may break new grounds if what I was talking about with the, the more sophisticated maps because of the data just makes things untenable because the power of technology has been taken a little bit too far. Well, two reactions to that. Number one, I don't think political difficulty makes for constitutional necessity. And so just because Congress is politically incapable of achieving the result doesn't mean we, under our constitutional system, throw this problem back on the courts, which were not set up to handle this kind of problem. Uh, second, as to Ben's uh, second point about the cases coming out of the 20 22 cycle, uh, given that it is 2018, and we have three cases before the Supreme Court arising out of the 2010 cycle. So the cases that will resolve this issue should be resolved then in uh, 2028 or 29. Is that what you're suggesting, Ben? Well, I'm second. <laughs> I'm suggesting the second Tuesday of whatever the third week of March is to be resolved. Okay. Sort of the never. So, I mean, one other point about the standards in Congress. It is tough for me as a philosophical matter to see Republicans, states' rights Republicans, and the, the fierce federalism that Republicans like to think we practice, actually agreeing to a national set of standards for something like redistricting. Fair well, enough. I might argue against it, but I'm saying Congress has the power. <laughs> okay. But, and I think it ought to be exercised constitutionally uh, by Congress rather than by the courts. All right, so that's kind of the um, end of our formal part of this, and now we have time for questions, significant amount of time, and we have two mics. Uh, so just let McConnell. me uh, ask everyone to line up, but there's a microphone here in the <laughs> aisle, and line up uh, for questions. And while you're, uh, and, and speak clearly in that so that the recording can be made, that would be uh, very helpful. And let me just, if I may, uh, uh, prime the pump with, uh, with a question that sort of brings us back to the cases before the Supreme Court now. Um, and so, you know, a, a few years ago in Vieth, the court wanted to do something about gerrymandering and didn't because they couldn't find a judicially manageable standard, meaning a, an objective enough standard for evaluating gerrymandering that it won't look like they are themselves now the, the political players. And it seems to me that consideration is just as strong now as ever. Uh, but in the cases for this year, uh, there were experts who came up with this uh, efficiency gap standard, which was much ballyhooed in the press as being the objective standard that, go, that, uh, that solves this problem. And at least it looked to me as a non-expert in this field as though it was that promise that induced the court to grant cert and re-enter this uh, rather difficult thicket. And I'm just wondering whether the panel believes that the efficiency gap standard has any prospect of being adopted because it's, you know, again, not as, as a non-expert. It, it looked to me as though that standard was exposed as being uh, not a very uh, attractive standard for the, largely because um, all that cl the, the clumping that Pam described, you know, packing and, uh, and packing and cracking, the, the packing that was that Pam talked about has been done by Democrats voluntarily by gathering together. You know, the large cities are you know 80 some odd percent Democratic, and the Republicans are more evenly split across the rest of the state. And the and and the effect of that is that if you don't do any gerrymandering at all, if you did a completely you know, random uh, 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 a set of, of districts, uh, the efficient that Democrats would lose, not get as many seats, because their, their self-packing makes an efficiency gap. And the result of that is that in order to reduce the efficiency gap to you know, zero or at least to a small number, you'd have to gerrymander, deliberately gerrymander in favor of Democrats in most states. And I think that makes the efficiency gap a rather unattractive measure. And I'm just curious whether 
that's uh, whether you expect that the court might take that. And if not, is there any other objective, judicially manageable standard on the table that might get us out of the beef problem? So let me start by saying I, I think the reason the court took the case was the artifact of the three-judge court that Pam alluded to earlier. The lower court had found a gerrymander. The, so the Supreme Court could summarily affirm, which would say that the lower court was right to find a gerrymander, but that the standard may not be right. That wasn't a viable thing to do. It could summarily reverse um, without going in there. But we've heard from a number of justices they feel a special obligation to hear these cases. So certainly I think the efficiency gap was a good marketing tool for getting the lower court interested. But I'm going to disagree with the idea that there was no good standard in Vieth. There were four good standards in Vieth, or three and a half. <laughs> they were all paraded before Justice Kennedy in a kind of beauty pageant. He didn't see anything he liked, and he said, keep bringing me contestants. And so the efficiency gap is a way of repackaging the kind of asymmetry standards and different measures that we've had for a number of years, any one of which would be serviceable if we think that this should be reined in. Um, and uh, uh, it gives a way for the court to say, we're do looking at something new. But I don't think it's all that new. And in fact, uh, Nick Stephanopoulos, who's one of the creators of this, uh, has brought up some of the other asymmetry standards which have been proposed in the past and shown the results are basically the same under all the standards. And in terms of your point that uh, the efficiency gap can't deal with the question of uh, natural geographic concentration, uh, I'm not here to defend the efficiency gap, but what I think Nick has said is that the efficiency gap just tells you that there's a potential problem, and then you need to look and see if it can be explained by other factors like natural concentration. So I don't think anyone is proposing, and I know uh, Nick and Eric are not proposing the efficiency gap as the sole standard that will judge any of these cases. Um, so uh, uh, it's nice packaging. Uh, I don't think that... Uh, it's really going to be any different if the court decides to wait in than what it could have done in 2004, given the standards that the plaintiffs and the dissenters had proposed in that case. Um, I'm proud to say that uh, uh, Tennessee, according to a chart I saw in, uh, I can't remember where it was, but uh, has an efficiency gap of zero uh, for its legislative map. Um, so whoever drew the lines there did a fairly good job under even efficiency gap standards. But th the short answer is, uh, no, I don't think the court is likely to adopt the efficiency gap as a standard uh, for the reasons that Professor hasn't just articulated. Well, yeah, there were three standards in Vieth. There's a fourth standard now, the efficiency gap. That was kind of brushed aside when they got to the Supreme Court and they turned to political symmetry as the measurement. And I recently read an article like uh, somebody from Princeton who was saying, well, actually there are about nine different standards and depending on the state in which you live and the size of the state and the size of the districts, you have to apply one of these nine different standards. Um, and none of that sounds like a judicially manageable uh, standard, mechanical, as, as Pam said earlier, that gets the court out of the business of looking like that judges are now selecting legislators and judges are now making the political determination, which I think was the great fear that Justice Roberts expressed in the oral argument in Whitford. To, to adopt the efficiency gap and to try and put it into place would mean the court would have to rule on something that Pam said before, which is we're not going to worry about geographic-based redistricting anymore. We're going to do it on other characteristics in, in other ways. And I, would, I think that is a, probably an unworkable standard and not likely to come to fruition. Okay, so we have a number of questions there at the mic. Uh, gentleman there at the mic. Yeah, I'll just follow up on Professor McConnell's question, and actually the very first question asked that nobody actually answered, which is how you predict the Supreme Court to rule on these cases, <laughs> if anyone's comfortable <laughs> providing a guesstimate. Yes. Lawyers are always careful about that kind of thing. Um, John, want to venture a guess? Uh, you know, my best guess is that they punt in Whitford um, on standing, 
uh, that um, they've got a basis for kicking uh, Benisek, the Maryland case, back down um, on essentially kind of a ripeness, or, or it's a, it's a, it came up on a preliminary injunction, and the questions were whether or not uh, there was really an irreparable harm since no relief could be granted for the 2018 election, and that afforded them enough time to have a full hearing in the trial court. Uh, so I think, there's, I think there's a very good chance that the court punts all together on this and says, come back and see us next term and maybe takes the North Carolina case then as the vehicle through which to do that. Yeah, I, I, I saw the, uh, or I, I read, I should say, the, uh, the argument in the second case, the Maryland case, and I thought maybe they took the Maryland case because it would be a way to go after, if they decided them together, yeah. one Republican gerrymander, one Democratic gerrymander, and you know, there's some symmetry there, maybe. Um, but after reading that, uh, I came away thinking, uh, as John did, that there's a real problem in terms of technically speaking, whether there's any relief that the court could grant. And so the court could just decide not to hear that case. I think uh, what they know is that the North Carolina case is waiting in the wings, and what they know is further that if they don't give clarification at the end of this decade, these cases are going to keep coming, uh, which is why maybe they're still holding on to uh, the Wisconsin case, even though it was argued at the beginning of October. So I, I'm, I'm more confused than I was before I read the argument in the Maryland case as to what the court's going to do. Well, that's a bad sign. I, I, mean, I, I, I agree with all that. I think if you, if none of us can figure out, maybe somebody out there can, what the standard would be and what the relief would be, and they're not gonna, they're not gonna make new law. Okay, next question. One of the uh, great things about being a member of the rump faction of political scientists at this convention is that uh, this counts as my continuing non-legal education, even though I don't get any credit for it. Uh, uh, let me just read one sentence from your know, article, uh, section two of the 14th Amendment, and then pose my question on that basis. Uh, it reads, Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respect in their respect according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding excluding Indians not taxed. Uh, so two questions. Number one, that suggests that the job of the decennial census is to determine as accurately as possible the number of persons in each state. Uh, question, does that raise constitutional issues if a census is conducted in a way that tends not to produce that result? Question number two, uh, on the basis of this language having to do with apportionment, which is the predicate for redistricting, since you can't redistrict if you don't know how many representatives you are, is the suggestion that it would be constitutional to use a number of citizen standards for redistricting, even though it's perfectly clear that the number of persons is the standard for apportionment? Uh, John, you may have an opinion yeah, on the, this. The, the, the argument that's being made, first, for apportionment purposes, that clause is absolutely clear, and, and the court said so in the Evenwell case, is that for apportionment purposes, you have to use the whole number of inhabitants uh, for allocating the number of congressmen among the states. For redistricting purposes, the court left open the question of what your population base could be, whether you could, you know, it said, to, it, they, the court explicitly approved total population as a basis for redistricting, but did not explicitly disapprove using citizen uh, population. And the argument in favor of using citizen population as advanced by the even well plaintiffs is that the use of total population for redistricting purposes leads to the creation of essentially rotten boroughs in areas that are seeing uh, large numbers of non-citizen uh, populations, which tend to be urban areas, 
uh, you know, whether it's New York or Miami or Houston or Chicago uh, or uh, LA or, you know, it, it tends to be urban areas rather than historic areas of uh, Latino populations such as the Valley in Texas or Northern New Mexico. Uh, so those, that's the question is, is equal, does one person, one vote mean that your vote should count equally in terms of eligibility to vote? In other words, should you be measured in your district against a pop, another district, or do you have just total population, whether you're eligible to vote or not? And the prison, prison population issue is, is maybe a simpler analogy for that. You have legislative districts in which maybe a third or a half of the population consists of prisoners who are citizens but have been, may have lost their right to vote, so they can't vote. So you have essentially a rotten borough situation in those cases where you have a legislator who is elected by 10,000 votes, whereas in your district, which is primarily citizen-based, it would require 20,000 votes to get elected. And that's, that's the argument that's being advanced. That's one of my questions. Yeah. What about the other one? On the other question, uh, if the executive is charged with conducting the census, um, I don't think you could say that they're violating the Constitution by asking particular questions. Uh, even if that might. Uh, I think that uh, it, well, it, was on, it was on the census until 1950, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think a stronger attack on the citizenship question in particular is that they may have violated the, uh, the Administrative Procedure Act in terms of how that question was put on. And, and that's, the, I think, the strongest basis for the legal challenge to that. I don't think there's a, well, I, I, I'm not sure if there's a constitutional challenge. There may be, maybe California's uh, case has a constitutional challenge as well, but it seemed to me that the APA challenge, uh, that this was basically arbitrary and not well vetted, was, is going to be a stronger basis to try and knock that question out of the courts. There's always a constitutional challenge in California yeah. to anything that the Trump administration does. Thank you. Ben? No, I agree with these yeah. answers. Okay, next question. Uh, thank you. So we've talked a lot about standards for combating gerrymandering, and of course the other tactic is institutional. So some states have adopted independent commissions. The theory that's a different way of controlling gerrymandering, and I wonder if you guys have any thoughts about that. For example, if, if Congress were trying to fix it, could they solve the problem by just saying to every state, you're required to have an independent commission? Would there be some reason they couldn't do that? If you think the courts should be the ones resolving this, and the only th problem is that the courts need a manageable standard, would a manageable standard be every state has to have an independent commission if they want to draw districts. And if they couldn't do that, if there are problems with that, what are those and what does that tell us? <laughs> uh, I think there are uh, performance-based problems with commissions. Uh, I, think, I think if you look at the commissions and what they've done, they've been most successful in totally homogeneous states like Iowa, and it gets a little messy anywhere else. Uh, I did the New Jersey Commission last time, which, which was the most political, least transparent procedure I think I've ever been a part in in, in all the redistricting things I did. Uh, I marvel at the California Commission, where, thank goodness, it's a one-party state these days, because otherwise it'd be really messy, and the criteria of you can know not, absolutely nothing about your subject to qualify for the commission. Um, I, I just don't... I mean, people may have different experiences with Arizona or Washington. I don't think any of them work particularly well, and I would rather have the yeasty mix of the legislative process um, doing it. I, I think that the, the, if we look at outputs, the commissions have not produced the most extreme gerrymanders. So if that's what we're most concerned about, and that's where the constitutional standard is, then even though I agree that there are flaws with the commissions, and they don't, you know, some commissions require that you draw competitive districts, others don't require that. You know, they have different ways in which they're constituted. I suppose Congress could say, uh, you know, uh, uh, you have to adopt a commission and it can't be a majority of one party or something like that. I don't see any reason why Congress under its uh, elections clause powers uh, couldn't do that. Um, and it would probably stop the worst offenses, but it's not necessarily clear that it's gonna provide better representation. 
And back to the point that I think Ben and I agreed on, uh, neither of us can imagine this Congress actually doing something like that. So I, I think that's off the table. Uh, I hate to quote Professor Carlin in absentia, but I heard her earlier this week, and she pointed out that uh, commissions tend to work fairly well the first time, <laughs> and then everybody figures out how to game the commission, and the second time it doesn't work quite so well. Yeah, I mean, I will add, uh, in California, it was major Republican donors who wanted to push for the commission, the air quote independent commission. It, turns out to be not that independent, and so there's a lot of unintended consequences as well. Next well, question. The alternative was uh, to have the Democrats continue to draw the legislature, so I still think Republicans are better off with this commission than they would have been had the California legislature well, drawn the lines. The, the staffers for the commission were all pretty much the Democratic staffers. That's correct. So it, yeah. so. <laughs> they're, they're, they're getting it anyway with the illusion of, of independence now. That's what, yeah. that's what Republicans think anyway, so. Next question. Hi, Elaine K. Mark from Brookings. Um, Richard, you mentioned the Apportionment Act of 1911. No, John, or, John, uh, John, John did. John did, okay. And one of the interesting things to me about it is, is how it caps the House of Representatives at 435. Okay, yeah, I think you see where I'm going with yeah. this. And that cap seems to be largely responsible for the imbalance, particularly in the Electoral College where you have states like Wyoming um, representing, you have states, uh, each elector in Wyoming representing 170 some thousand people and each elector in California representing three quarters of a million people. And it seems to me that that's wasted votes, that that's an efficiency problem, um, it's a one man, one vote problem. I mean, but I'm not enough of a lawyer, I'm a, like Bill, I'm a political scientist, so could you all sort of talk about that and why the House is capped? Should the cap be lifted? I think that's a pol great political science question, and the political scientists ought to answer that. Uh, you know, when, the, when they were debating the Constitution, the original size of a congressional district was 35,000 people. And the anti-federalists protested that bitterly, saying that's in too large, that's huge. Nobody can represent 35,000 people. And now, the, the, the last cycle, the average district size was 720,000. It'll probably be what, uh, Rick, maybe 750 or 755 this next time. Um, I think there are a lot of issues that arise from that. I mean, you know, obviously the loss of uh, accountability, transparency, I mean, it, it, the loss of community. Uh, as I think we discussed earlier, is how can you represent 750,000 people? Of course, how can you represent a state of 30 million as a senator? So, you know, there are other issues there, but we, we're not going to talk about the 17th Amendment, too. So, you know, we've got sufficient uh, uh, stuff on our table. I, I certainly see the problem that you're um, referencing. I just wonder what a House of Representatives of 3,000 or 4,000 representatives would look like and how it would function. And so that's the flip side. Uh, because I run the election law blog, I get people who um, write to me all the time with their favorite issue that I should write about, like uh, ranked choice voting is a very popular one. Uh -huh. um, uh, but uh, there's one uh, person who writes to me all the time that the main problem the California legislature has is that it's too small and that it's you know, each representative. And so we should have a legislature of a few thousand people. And I just think, I look at how this California legislature is working with the number of people it has. I can't imagine making it 10 times larger or 20 times larger and that as a legislative body it's going to function very well. So I think that's the flip side problem of this. So Mark, question? Yeah, thanks so much for a great discussion. Um, my question is about unintended consequences, something I think you <laughs> mentioned, Harmeet, which is just that um, you know, there's certain rules about apportionment that are mandated in the constitutional text, say about how, how congressional representatives are apportioned. Um, and then, you know, we've been adding several rules, uh, I mean, through judicial decision to those rules. So one person, one vote. You know, now we have the Voting Rights Act and various kind of majority minority district rules. We have Shaw claims. Um, 
you know, do, you, do any of you have thoughts I mean, about adding another rule to that mix of rules and, and you know, about the sort of potential unintended consequences of that, uh, just as a general matter, or maybe how that impacts your view about if there is a specific standard that the court ought to do, um, you know, which, which one is it? I'm thinking of something that Ben mentioned earlier, which is just that, right, early you had this situation where the kind of combination of one person, one vote rules and uh, Voting Rights Act rules you know, led to some, I mean, people would argue some forms of gerrymandering that were favorable to Republicans because of the sort of unintended clash of these rules. So I'm just wondering, you know, I'm not uh, adverse to rules, but if we add more and more on, uh, is there a risk of unintended consequences and sort of how do you see that playing out in the, you know, what standard the court might adopt here? John? Well, of course there is a risk of unintended oh, consequences. Uh, we've got a room full of uh, lawyers here, and the first thing they'll do as soon as a rule is adopted is figure out some way to get around it or to use it to their advantage. And that's what's happened with one person, one vote, and it's what's happened with the Voting Rights Act and uh, the cases that flowed out of that act. And... Uh, and that will happen again if you have a ruling from the Supreme Court that finds that political gerrymandering is justiciable and sets a standard. So whatever the standard is, you know, there are people in this room who are going to figure out how to use that standard to their advantage. So, and, you know, and then you're going to have elections. I mean, you know, you go back through this and as Ben started, started out, what this is, is a, a lot of this is just about elections. And it's about the fact that in 2010, the Republicans were the beneficiary of a wave election precisely at the point that redistricting was going to take place. And um, the Republicans may be the on the receiving end of some of that. Remember, all those Republican legislators elected in 2010 were elected, or most of them were elected uh, in despite Democrat gerrymanders. Um, so, um, you know, yeah. So I, I certainly think we've seen unintended consequences. We see it in the campaign finance context, for example, where part, part of laws are overturned and part are upheld. And you get, um, but that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that the court intervention is uh, not worth it overall. I think we're better off with a one person, one vote standard. I think that's pretty well established now. I thought, at least I thought it was, that there was consensus about that. Um, uh, Do you mean until my question? I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't suggesting no, that. No, I meant until the last few years when the issue has come back and in the, even in the Evanwell case, uh, uh, Justice Thomas seemed to indicate, and Justice Alito as well, that maybe that was a wrong turn in the 1960s. Um, I, in, in the partisan gerrymandering area, I took the position when Veith was decided that Justice Kennedy was right and that we should wait until there's an emerging consensus uh, that there's a problem that needs to be solved. I now think we're getting close to that because of those things I talked about, the convergence of uh, increased uh, technology and making more effective gerrymanders and polarization and the race or party problem that I now think that the courts probably do need to get involved. But I think, and this will be the second reference to Pam's brief, but now she's not here to hear it. Pam's brief in the Gill case makes the point that if you don't rein in partisan gerrymandering directly, this stuff's still going to get litigated in the realm of these other cases. So that's, a, that's an unintended consequence if the court doesn't act. But I think either way, the court is going to continue to be asked to rule in these cases uh, when someone's on the wrong side of one of these uh, disputes. And so this litigation is going to continue. It's, I think one of the benefits of actually ruling on partisan gerrymandering directly is that the court will actually be doing what it says it does, as opposed to sometimes what it looks like in some of these partisan gerrymandering cases, in some of these racial gerrymandering cases, where they say they're doing one thing but appear to be doing something else. It, it, it's such a dynamic area that if a ruling comes out, there will be elections. And the electorate is fickle, and so some people are going to benefit from the ruling and some people aren't. And the ones who don't benefit from the ruling will say, "Guy, there are unintended consequences all over this thing. So we better we better go in and fix it." So. Well, I want to follow up on your question, Mark, though, with uh, Professor Hazen and 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 say, back to Baker versus Carr. Uh, would it, would we have a better jurisprudence in this area?
if the court in Baker had used the Republican form of government clause and revisited Luther versus Borden than going the 14th Amendment route? I don't know that it would be any different. Okay. I don't know. Fair enough answer. Be an unintended consequence. Next question. Uh, to go back to um, Sam Zacker from NYU, to go back to the uh, way that uh, uh, Mike McConnell framed this at the beginning, we had a recognition from the framers that gerrymandering was a problem and that self-interest would manifest itself through manipulations of various kinds. And we had a fix in the Constitution. The fix is that the Congress has to seat the delegation so that there would be an ability to check the states in their perversions that they might be uh, uh, fall to. The difficulty we have is that we didn't anticipate political parties. And so the gerrymander takes place at the national level now, and the local is just the manifestation of what's conducted from above. So we have a problem here constitutionally between a problem that's recognized at the framing and a solution that proved over time not to work. And that's a different kind of constitutional challenge than we usually have of an evolving uh, set of considerations, marriage equality, what have you. This is something that's been with us from the beginning. So when Will Bowdy asks, maybe if, Congre if the constitutional framers came at this from the vantage point of institutional design, we should return to that and start thinking, how has this been responded to institutionally? We have examples. Everybody else who came out of Westminster went the commission route, right? They were the boundary commissions in every country have worked. It's not that they fail over time. They have worked. How did England get rid of the rotten boroughs? They made a political pact that they would put this into the boundary commissions. It has worked. And the question is, yes, we, are, we can be very cynical in the United States and say, oh, yes, everything will fail over time. We've had a Fed for a century, and it works reasonably well, and it's reasonably independent, not perfect, nothing is ever perfect, but you have a defect from the moment of the constitutional founding. I think one of the difficulties that we have as legal academics, speaking from my side, is that we're too court-focused. And for 15 years, we've been playing beauty contests, as somebody said, with Anthony Kennedy over this. Today he likes partisan swings, tomorrow maybe he'll like efficiency gap. He wants a little First Amendment thrown in. And I've done this, I wrote an amicus brief in these cases also saying you want First Amendment, here's First Amendment. What is it? It's just repackaging the same old crap. Every one of these is repackaging exactly the same arguments that maybe this time Justice Kennedy will fast on. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. But I think that we do a disservice if we too easily say to Will, hey, you know, we're political and men and women of the world. We know the realities of politics. The Congress will never do it. The court will never do it. Sometimes it's important to stand back and say, there was an institutional response. Maybe it's time to return to that way of thinking about it. So, so what do you think? I just <laughs> <laughs> Paul, are we too much focused on the courts? Richard, rather? Uh, I, think, I think those points are well taken. But uh, you know, far be it from me to uh, you know, say that you're not cynical enough. But uh, <laughs> uh, there may be a breaking point. I mean, the next panel is on polarization. It seems to me that this fits into a much larger discussion, not just about drawing district lines, but about how we're going to have a functioning government. And, that the solutions to those problems may depend upon changing uh, how we do our elections in a much broader way. Um, but I think that's a conversation for the next panel, really. John? Well, I, th I, think, I think those are excellent points. Uh, but the fundamental issue here is what is the nature of representation? And what type of representation are we trying to achieve? And so when you talk about the political fix or the fix for the current perceived problem, uh, we need to ask ourselves the first question, which is where do we, how do we want representation to work in this type of republic? And 
once we get an answer to that, once we've made that determination, then I think that tends to dictate the outcomes. All right, so we have time for uh, maybe one or two more questions. Ben, did you want to chime in here? Uh, oh, just, I mean, Sam, you raise a great and articulate point about it. I, I was listening to it and said, yeah, it makes some sense. I, I'm not sure I know the steps that would get it done, nor do I think, nor do I think that there are any sterling examples of commissions that exist now that you would point to and say, God, we really got to be like that. It, this, it works so well. All right, Professor, you have a question? Okay, well, this may be very quick because Sam just said that this is just repackaged garbage, basically. But I'm <laughs> curious about your question, your answers, which is, does it make a difference whether the court rules on first amendment? Say it rules. Say it says something other than we dismiss on standing grounds or some other uh, duck. Um, if it rules on the first amendment or if it finds an equal protection violation. Uh, from my perspective, First Amendment is much more elegant because there is this problem with the equal protection theory, which is why is partisan identity a problem in this area if it's not a problem? It, why is it something to scrutinize as a basis for uh, differentiation in this area if not in others? Whereas if you start thinking about this as viewpoint discrimination or retaliation on the basis of your ideology, it's, uh, it, it becomes a sort of a, a, it answers the question why this is so troubling. But in practice, does it make any difference? Now, one one thought is that an equal protection violation is really we're looking at effects and so it requires the court to come up with an answer for why the map on the ground or what the map on the ground should look like. Whereas the First Amendment right now is really focused on intent, on a kind of government animus. So one might think, just linking it to the earlier question, all the court would have to do if it finds a First Amendment violation is say there's something troubling about the intent here. You have to figure out another way, maybe another procedural way rather than another map to satisfy us that this isn't a kind of a viewpoint discrimination, that the intent is not a bad one. But what are your views on whether or not it makes any difference at all? I don't think it makes a difference at all. Um, I wouldn't say repackaged garbage. But what I'd say is that even if you decide that the harm is this representational harm under the First Amendment, you still have to decide what your standard is. Is it going to be an intent-only standard? If you go back to the Bandemer case, which was yeah, a 1986 right. case, Justice White basically assumes, of course, uh, one party's trying to screw over the other party. We don't even have to talk about that. We need a test for effect. Uh, but now there's been this uh, reemergence, I think, this year in the, some of the amicus briefs of an intent-only standard. And the North Carolina case, which is coming up, is kind of the test, the case for that, because there you have on the record statement saying, we are doing this for partisan reasons. We are engaging in a partisan gerrymander. The intent couldn't be clearer. If, that, you know, if, if that's going to be the test, then Ben will be advising his clients to not say anything like that in the next round, and they'd be safe. So, you know, you're still going to have to come up with a test whether you package it, uh, whether, you find the, whether you find the harm in this part of the Constitution or that. You're still going to have to have an efficiency gap or an asymmetry standard or a proportionality standard or something. So I don't think it gets us out of the box, uh, even if it is more elegant and, you know, it'll read better in the case books. John? Uh, I can't disagree. Um, you know, intent, I think Justice White's words were, intent should not be hard to prove in this area. <laughs> and uh, that, that's obviously the case. Um, so you can't use an intent only standard if, you're, if your goal is to achieve a remedy here. You've got to have, if, you, if you're trying to establish liability, intent alone will get you there every time. So you've got to have something more than that. And the question is, is there anything between intent and mathematical formulae which gets you there? Which is kind of why I, I'm sort of attracted to what I'm going to call the Carlin approach, except it's not the way she wants to apply it, uh, which is go ahead and let the courts apply the facially neutral standards they have been applying under one person, one vote, under Shaw versus Reno, and yes, they are dealing with partisan gerrymanders, but that gives them the tools to weed out the most extreme examples without inventing a whole new cause of action, a whole new area of law. Although, you know, it's not clear that in a place like Wisconsin, where you can't point to race as the, you can't uh, the other no. factor, then that allows then that allows you to have extreme gerrymanders in, uh, in mostly white states, uh, but not in uh, the American South, which would be kind of, if you're doing just the subterfuge, which would be kind of an interesting uh, outcome. Also another example of unintended consequences. 
So I, I, I think, so let's take this from the point of view of the people who will actually be drawing the maps in state legislatures. They will say to the lawyers, all right, great, what's the standard? What have they done now? Just tell me what I can do and not do, and then I'm going to go off and draw my lines. So from the point of view of the, the, the people who are actually going to implement your new standard, elegant, inelegant, however it, it comes across, it will be a very practical exercise. And I do believe the history of this is that no matter what the standard is that the court comes up with, the Wiley political operatives will figure out what they can do and not do and how they will justify it and draw the lines to their political advantage and the Republicans and Democrats will fight and they'll make legal arguments on both sides as a negotiating tool as opposed to some overarching um, kind of a, a piece of poetry they're trying to live up to. So I'm not sure it's going to affect behavior at the end of the day, however you articulate that standard. Okay. Um, we have time for one more question, so let's do one, and then we will break for coffee and so forth. Uh, thank you. Uh, Daniel Stitt of the Hewlett Foundation. A question about multi-member districts, which obviously have been banned uh, since 1967 at the federal level, but I think there's 10 states uh, that still use uh, some form of multi-member districts for state legislative seats. And I think about 15% of state legislators nationwide are elected in multi-member districts. So uh, I want to ask the, the panel about an argument that's been bubbling up in the reform community that multi-member districts might uh, decrease the pressure on districting by allowing a more diverse array of interests to be represented by multiple members within a district. I know some of you have of maybe you've been involved in drawing some lines in states that use those. I uh, just was curious, what's been your experience about the, the districting dynamics when you have multi-member districts at the state level? Does that, does that change things? Does that decrease the political pressure or just lead to new, new uh, pathways to, to securing political advantage? I don't know, back in the 70s when I was attacking Democratic gerrymanders in Tennessee, uh, they always used multi-member districts uh, to create the most egregious gerrymanders. Different pressures, same results? I think you have to think more boldly if you're going to go for reform and maybe not have districts at all. Oh, yeah. Right. That's weird. So with that, um, <laughs> that's a whole can of worms. But uh, I want to thank the panelists here. Please give them a round of applause.